So Samantha and Zoe, you did such a good job of grappling with this really difficult story. Here we have a man who's challenging authority in the name of equality get swallowed by the earth and another man who's in power be defended as the divinely appointed leader. How are we supposed to relate to this? Zoe, you concluded that Moses was both humble and a good leader and was the right person to be chosen. And Samantha, you concluded that Korah was a dangerous populist and it was right for God to remove his threat, even though you do not think that he should have been killed. I want to focus on the first word in the Parsha to respond to both of you. The first word in the portion, in the portion is Vayikach. The portion opens, Vayikach Korach, Korach took. But the verb Vayikach, he took, has no object. Korach took what? Onkelos, who translated the Torah in the first century of the Common Era, said that Vayikach meant that Korach took himself, separated himself from the people. Ramban explains, he betook himself to one side in order to separate himself from the rest of the congregation so that he could fight for himself. Midrash Tanhuma says that Vayikach means that Korach became divided, that his heart carried him away to act against God. Of all of these explanations, what I like best is the simplest. Rabbi Art Green says, Korach took simply means Korach was a taker. He points to the Midrash in which the rabbis say that Korach was a wealthy man, and much of what he possessed came from others. He took things that were not his. Green teaches that in Yiddish, the phrase rich as Korach is used to describe rich and stingy people who never tire of taking. It's interesting to combine that with your teaching, Samantha, in which we see that Korach, like a certain figure from our own time, extends that habit of taking even so far as to co-opt the concept and language of equality, to take the language of populism to pretend that he's fighting for everyone when he's only fighting for himself, to take and manipulate people's very real frustrations and use them for his own benefit, to take people's trust in him, to take and sunder people's trust in each other and their society, to take the integrity of the institutions of civil society, to take democracy itself, to never tire of taking. Dangerous indeed. In contrast and direct opposition to this figure of Korah, we have Moses, humblest of all, as you taught us, Zoe, about whom we say in the traditional Shabbat morning Amidah, Yismach Moshe b'matenat chelko. As Art Green translates it, Moses' greatest joy is in the act of giving that which has become his. Let's unpack that. So Torah is known as Matan Torah, as the gift of Torah. Moses received Torah on Mount Sinai and then gave it to his generation. The gift got passed down from generation to generation until it reached us. Torah, by the way, is not just the scroll that we have in the Ark or that we read from, but all of the interpretations and all of the teachings about how to live, about what a good life looks like. In every generation, we receive it from our teachers and then pass it on to those who follow us, receiving and giving. Now, Zoe, you taught us about role models. And for the Jewish people, Moses is our model of how to receive and how to give. Just two weeks ago in the Torah, God took the special spirit that God had given to Moses and gave it to the 70 elders. And when other people started to speak in prophecy, Joshua, Moses' assistant, got worried that they were usurping Moses' authority. And Moses said in response, are you worried, are you wrought up on my account? Would it be that all God's people were prophets? Moses didn't need to separate himself like Korah or be special. Moses wanted to give what he had to everyone, recognizing that we would all be better off if it was shared. In Kabbalah, there's an idea of Shefa, which is the never-ending flow of God's blessing upon us, that we're meant to give to others and give back to God through mitzvot and acts of loving kindness. That's what Torah is. That's what Judaism is, a training in the perpetual flow of receiving and giving, a continual, never-ending practice of gratitude, which is simply acknowledging the gifts and generosity, which is giving it out. The goal is not to only give. We all must take. We all should take. We receive learning, 
We receive blessing. We receive love. We receive the generosity of others. The point is to let ourselves receive all that comes to us open-heartedly, to take it in, and then to keep the cycle flowing right through us, from gratitude to generosity, taking pleasure, joy, as Moses did, in giving as much as we receive. For we know that we're all better off when we're all better off. This is not abstract, and it's not just nice, and it's not only personal or interpersonal. It has to do with policy. It has to do with our resignation to homelessness and hunger in a country with billionaires. It has to do with racial justice and whether we have the collective will for reparations. It has to do with whether and how we welcome refugees and immigrants. It has to do with taxation and minimum wage and what we're going to do about the chasm of wealth inequality in this country. We have not solved these problems because we have not been living according to the, according to the model of Moses. And because we don't solve these problems, we're vulnerable to the Korachs of our time. If we would really believe, as Moses did, that we're all better off when we're all better off, if we would really see ourselves as recipients and transmitters of blessing, as conduits in the continual flow of receiving and giving, if religion really became an ongoing practice of gratitude and generosity, all of those policy questions would lead to sharing. This is not utopian. This is available. Korach lives in us, and Moses lives in us, and we always have the ability to choose Moses. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>